again to another class of taxonomy. Today we are going to go to lesson two. Now remember in lesson one we are talked about using the five kingdom system where organisms are based in five kingdoms that is kingdom animalia, kingdom plantae, kingdom fungi, kingdom protoctista also called protista and kingdom monera which comprises of bacteria. So for today's lesson, we shall be looking at kingdom animalia. This kingdom comprises of animals. The characteristics of the animals, you have got one, they are multicellular, meaning they are made up of many cells. Two, they are eukaryotic, meaning they have got a cell that has got a distinct nucleus covered by a nuclear membrane and distinct organelles. And then you find this cell doesn't have a cell wall and doesn't have plastids. Three, they have heterotrophic nutrition, meaning they obtain food material from other organisms. They don't make, they don't synthesize their food material. And as they obtain organic food material from other organisms, they do so by taking it in through, the, they, by taking it in, so to speak. So therefore you say they have heterotrophic nutrition and their nutrition is mainly by ingestion. Ingestion meaning to take in. For the animals you find that they have specialized tissues, organs and organ system. In these many cells that they have, we find a group of similar cells will come together and they're specially developed to form a specific task, giving us the tissue. And then the organs is basically a structure made up of different types of tissue that now carries out a specific function that is more specialized than the tissue. And then when you find a network of organs working together to perform a certain task, that gives us what we call the organ systems. So animals have got specialized tissues, organs, and organ systems. And the last characteristic we shall talk about is that the reproduction in animals is mainly sexual meaning they reproduce by means of gametes, male and female gametes. For the kingdom animalia, it has got a number of phyla. The kingdom is divided into a number of phyla. The number of phyla we find in this kingdom tends to vary from one author to another. For us, we shall consider 13 phyla in kingdom animalia. The 13 phyla from the simplest to the complex one, we have porifera, we have Cilinterata, also referred to as Nidaria. We have Platyhelmets. We have Nematoda. We have um, Nematinia. We have Rotifera. We have Anelida. We have Molasca. The Onychophora. Arthropoda. Echinodermata. Hemicodata. And Codata. So out of this phyla, we shall look at some of them. We shall select some that we shall look at and consider further. So I look at such of the phylum porifera. Porifera is a phylum comprising of sponges. Sponges are characterized by having a body wall that has got many pores or holes in it. So porifera actually means pore bearer. So for the porifera, which comprises of the sponges, it is a phylum of simple organisms, simple animals. So for the characteristics of the porifera, we find the porifera, they do not have tissues and organs. Number two, they have a skeleton that is made up of spicules or horny fibers. The spicules can either be made up of calcium carbonate or be made up of silica. If they are made up of calcium carbonate, we say they are calcareous spicules. If they are made up of silica, then we say they are silica or siliceous spicules. And for the case of the porifera, third characteristic, they are sessile, meaning they do not move. They tend to attach themselves on a substratum and do not move. Number four, the body has two layers of cells in its early developmental stages. The two layers of cells, you have the ectoderm, the outer layer, and the endoderm, the inner layer. Now, because it has got two layers of cells, we say they are diploblastic. Di meaning two. The body basically consists of a single cavity or a system of cavities. 
and then they communicate the exterior via pores that are found in the body wall. These many pores in the body wall connecting the cavity that makes up the body and the exterior are what give the porifera their name, which means pore bearer. For the porifera, they are mostly marine, meaning they are found in salty water. And then we have a few, mostly salty water, but a few can be found in fresh water. In terms of reproduction, the porifera can have either sexual reproduction or asexual reproduction. Asexual is where they reproduce without making gametes. Their asexual reproduction, they do it by budding. Sexual reproduction is where they reproduce by forming gametes. Now, for those that have sexual reproduction, you'll find an individual sponge has got both male and female reproductive structures within itself. So therefore, they are hermaphrodites. Where hermaphrodite means an organism with both male and female reproductive structures. For the porifera, the different animals are normally related to one another. So you find some similar characteristics they have that can help us to know which group of organisms is related to the other. Now, for the porifera, the organisms in this kingdom don't have characteristics really that they share with the other kingdoms of animals that we know. So because of that, we cannot say these simple organisms in porifera could have given rise to other higher animals that we know. And because they are thought not to have given rise to any other phylum of higher organisms, porifera therefore are referred to as a dead end phylum. For this phylum, there are three classes. <coughs> the three classes that we have in the phylum porifera is basically based on the nature of the skeleton. So of the three classes, number one, class calcarea, this comprises of sponges that have a skeleton made of calcium carbonate. These ones have got a calcareous, they have got calcareous spicules in them. And because the skeleton has spicules made of calcium carbonate, the same calcium carbonate found in the bones, you'll find them also therefore being referred to as the bony sponges. The spicules have got three or four rays in them. Then we have class hexactinelida. The hexactinelida now comprises of sponges with a skeleton made up of silica. It comprises of the silica spicules in it. Now silica is normally a component in the making of glass. For that reason, therefore, you'll find class hexactinelida also being referred to as the glass sponges. For them, the spicules basically are made up of six rays, and they are intertwined with one another. For that reason, they have got a very strong skeleton. And then you have the class demospongy. Demospongy now comprises of the sponges that have a skeleton made up of the spongin fibers. Some of them are marine, some of them are freshwater. This phylum is made up of simple organisms, but they do have some economic importance. We say some of them are used as beauty artifacts. The sponge you'll find being used for bathing, and so on. And then you have the second phylum we shall look at. Uh -huh. Phylum, Cilinterata. or also referred to as Nideria. Characteristics of organisms in this phylum. One, they have got a sac-like body cavity, which also acts as the gut or digestive system. For them, they also have a body that has got two layers of cells. So they also are diplo, Blastic, with the two layers comprising of an ectoderm and an endoderm. For them, they have radial symmetry, meaning cut any of them through the diameter, you are likely to get two parts that are equal, so you'll get two equal halves. They tend to exist in two forms, 
And because they exist in two forms, we say they are dimorphic. Di meaning two, morph meaning form. And the two forms that they have, we have got the polyp form and the medusa form. The polyp form is cylindrical and it is sessile, it does not move. Any movement it may have is basically by somersaulting. The medusa form is umbrella shaped and it is free swimming. It moves about by floating. The two forms, the polyp and medusa forms, tend to alternate with one another in the life cycle of the cylindrate. The other characteristic is that they have tentacles that have explosive cells. So whether it is the polyp form or medusa form, they have got tentacles. The tentacles in the polyp form are found on the upper end. On the medusa form, in the umbrella shape, they are found on the lower end. And the explosive cells that they tend to have, they assist in the capturing of prey, and these cells are referred to as nematoblasts. Phylum cylinterata has three classes. So this basically tells, is telling us about, this is the polyp form, which is basically cylindrical, and the medusa form, which is described as being umbrella shaped. The phylum has got three classes. So I've got one, class hydrozoa, two, class cyphozoa, and three, class anthozoa. To differentiate the three classes, hydrozoa are hydra-like. In them, we may have the polyp and medusa forms present, and one form may be reduced. In the class cyphozoa, class cyphozoa, they are characterized by having a complex medusa form with a gastrovascular system. Gastro meaning a digestive and circulatory system that are intertwined. And this gastrovascular system comprises of basically water-filled canals. For them, the polyp form is reduced. And then you have the anthozoa. For anthozoa, this is a cylindrate where the medusa stage is completely lost in the life cycle. So they don't have the medusa form in the life cycle. Then you have the phylum platy helmets. Platy means flat, helminths means warm. So this is a phylum comprising of flat worms. Characteristics of the flat worms, one, the body is flat, two, they are triploblastic, tri meaning three, and this is to tell us that their body has got three layers of cells. The ectoderm, which is the outer one, the mesoderm, the middle layer, and the endoderm, which is the innermost layer. For them, they have a mouth, but they do not have an anus. The gut or digestive system comprises of blind-ended branches. They do have flame cells for purposes of excretion and osmoregulation. They tend to be hermaphroditic, meaning every flatum you come across has got both male and female reproductive structures, so it can reproduce on its own. However, they have mechanisms to minimize self-fertilization from taking place. Most organisms in this particular phylum tend to be parasites. For phylum platyhelmets, it has got three classes. So you have got the class tubularia, the class trematoda, and the class cystoda. Now, for class tubularia, these are flatworms that produce some poisonous mucus. They tend to have cilia on the lower side of the body and they are not parasitic. So we come across a flatworm that produces mucus that they use to catch prey, poisonous mucus. They have cilia on the lower part of the body. They are not parasitic. Then that one belongs to class tubularia. And then you have the class trematoda. Trematoda are flatworms that are leaf-like in shape and they tend to have suckers at the ends. An example of a trematoda, we have the liver fluke. 
Then you have class histoda, comprising of flatworms that have a body that is ribbon shaped. This ribbon shaped body is made up of segments similar segments that we call proglottids. They don't have a distinct head, but they have got a head-like structure that is called a scolex. So if you come across a flatworm with a ribbon-shaped body that is spiral and made up of several segments that are similar to one another and a head-like structure, then that gives us a platyhelmet in the class Cystoda. For the cystoda, the head may either have spines or hooks, or it may not have them. If it has got spines and hooks, then we say the scolex is armed. If it doesn't have any spines or hooks, then we say the scolex is unarmed. So to illustrate examples of worms in the three classes, we have the planaria here. Basically, planaria is in the class tubularia the flatworms with cilia and produce mucus. We have the liver fluke that is in the class tubularia. And then we have the tapeworm that is in the class cystoda. <coughs> then we have the phylum nematoda. Nematoda comprises of round worms that uh, do not have any segments. Now, for the characteristics of the nematoda, we have, number one, the body is rounded or is cylindrical. Number two, it is unsegmented. So you normally say they have a cylindrical, non-segmented body. They are triploblastic. The body is narrow and pointed at both ends. And uh, depending on the structure of the body, it is quite easy to distinguish the male from the female. Female tends to be larger in size. Male is smaller in size, and the posterior pointed end is curved and has projections. For them, the reproduction is sexual, and the sexes are separate. We have got male and we have got female, which, as I said before, can be easily distinguished by the size and the nature of the posterior end. Larger in size, posterior end is not curved, that is a female. Smaller in size, posterior end is curved and has projections, then that is a male. The phylum also contains a number of parasites in it. For this particular phylum, we have got two main classes. Based on the presence or absence of a first mid sensory organ. So the two classes we have in phylum nematoda are class Adenophoria and class Sesanitia. So Adenophora has basically nematodes that do not have a fasmid sensory organ. They tend to be non parasitic. The class Sesanitia, for them, they are nematodes with the fasmid sensory organ present. For them, they tend to be parasitic in nature. So this is an illustration of the roundworm with an illustration showing the two sexes. As I said, the female tends to be larger in size and the posterior end is not curved. The male is smaller in size, the posterior end is curved and it has got these projections here that we refer to as spicules. <coughs> then you have phylum anelida. Anelida comprises of worms that are round and are segmented. So we say it is a phylum of segmented worms. For the characteristics of the anelida, say for them, they have a cylindrical body. The body has metameric segmentation, meaning it is made up of segments that are made comprising of similar units. And then the body segments have got Bristle-like structures called kitai. Bristle-like structure, these are basically structures that are made up of hair that is tough in nature. And the bristle, kitai have got a purpose that they serve. 
the worms use them to grip onto a soil surface or any other surface that they are attaching to and also they increase surface area. The worms may have or may not have parapodia. Parapodia are muscular appendages. Wherever parapodia are present, they tend to be the ones that attach to the segment of the worm and then the ketai attach on the parapodia. Where we have ketai without parapodia, then the ketai will directly attach onto the body segments of the worm. For them, they have a reproductive structure called a clitellum. The clitellum is basically an enlarged segment within the worm that is quite distinguishable. Usually it contains the reproductive structures in it. They have nephridia for excretion and osmoregulation. For them, they have a larva that has got cilia and moves around by swimming. This larva that is ciliated and is free swimming, we call it a trochophore larva. So for them we say they have a trochophore larva, and trochophore is general, meaning any free swimming ciliated larva. So you may find other animals also having the same. They have bilateral symmetry and they are triproblastic, meaning they have got three layers of cells in the early developmental stages. <laughs> For the anelida, there are three classes in this particular phylum. Class polychaeta, class oligochaeta, and class hirudinia. This is based on the presence or absence or number of kitai that are there. Class polychaeta comprises of anelids that have got many ketai present and also parapodia are present. Because they have got many ketai present, that is why they are referred to as polychaeta, poly meaning many. For the oligochaeta, the analysts in this particular class have got few ketai and they do not have parapodia. So the few ketai are directly connected to the body segments of the worm. For class hirudinia, they do not have parapodia or kita present, but they are segmented worms. For an illustration of an annelid, we have the earthworm, an example of an annelid. The earthworm is in class oligokita, meaning they have got few kita and parapodia are not present. <laughs> then you go to phylum mollusca. Mollusks comprise of organisms we call the mollusks. Now with the mollusks, the characteristics that they have, they have a soft muscular foot that is normally found on the belly side, also called the ventral side. They have a virus, visceral hump on the back side or dorsal side, and the visceral hump contains digestive organs. Visceral hump simply means an internal mass of substances within the organism. And then they also have a shell that tends to cover the visceral hump. They have a tongue-like radula that they use for purposes of feeding. They have gills called the tetanidia that they use for respiration, but the gills can also be used for filter feeding. They have a trochophore larva. Just like we said in the case of the annelids, trochophore larva is when we have a ciliated free swimming larva. They have simple eye spots that can distinguish light and dark, so they can tell night and day. They tend to have two or four sensory tentacles. For them, they reproduce by laying eggs. <coughs> this phylum has got five common classes based on the structure of the shell and basically also the tentacles that they have. So I've got class monoplacophora, also referred to as univalvia, class polyplacophora, also referred to as amphineura, class gastropoda, class lamellibranchiata, also called by valvia, and the class cephalopoda. To differentiate the classes, we have monoplacophora is when we have a mollusk with a single conical shell. 
conical meaning the shell is cone shaped. So you get a cross mollusk with a single conical shell, then that is in class monoplacophora. Polyplacophora comprises of mollusks with a shell, a conical shell that is divided into many units. So a mollusk with a conical shell with many units, then that falls into class polyplacophora, where poly means many. Gastropoda comprises of mollusks that have a large muscular foot. And for them, they tend to have a spiral shell. So large muscular foot, that is why they are referred to as gastropoda and a spiral shell. The shell is spiral because during its formation, the visceral hump rotates, causing the shell that covers it to become spiral in nature. And then you have the class lamellibranchiata or bivalvia. Mollusks in class bivalvia, they have a shell that is divided into two equal halves. Reason why we also refer to it as bivalvia. For them, the foot is greatly reduced. For class cephalopoda, cephalopoda, for them, either they don't have a shell or the shell is internal and greatly reduced. So shell is either absent or internal and greatly reduced. In addition, we have the foot is incorporated into the head and then it is modified into tentacles that have suckers. So it will be modified to give rise to between 8 to 10 tentacles. So for them, because the foot fuses with the head to give tentacles, they are now referred to as cephalopoda, where cepha means head, poda means foot, so cephalopoda means a fusion of the head and the foot. Illustration of mollusks that we have. We have the common snail. This is in class gastropoda. Here we have the octopus. Octopus is in class cephalopoda because we have the foot fused with the head to give rise to tentacles. <laughs> then we have phylum echinodermata. These organisms in this phylum are characterized by having spines in their skin. So the skin is rough because of the presence of spines. Now because the skin has got spines, echinodermata has a meaning. Echinodermata actually means spiny skin. For the characteristics of organisms in echinodermata, we have the skin has got calcareous spines and ossicles. Calcarea simply means they have got spines and ossicles that consist of calcium carbonate. For them, they are basically found in the marine. The adult is pentaradiate, but the larva has bilateral symmetry. For them, we find for most organisms, the mouth tends to be on the upper side and the anus is on the lower side. But for the echinodermata, we find the anus is on the upper side while the mouth is on the lower side. Reason why some people may call them the upside down animals. So the side where the mouth is, is the oral side. The side where the anus is, and therefore you don't have a mouth present, is the aboral side. So that gives them the characteristic of the mouth or oral side is on the lower side, while the aboral or anal side is on the upper side. The other characteristic is that they tend to have tube feet, also referred to as sectorial feet, that they use for movement. They are called sectorial because they are tubes. So when they attach onto a surface, they exert some suction pressure. For them, they don't have a proper circulatory system. For this particular phylum, we have got five classes. The class Asterias, also called Celarodoea. We have the class Echinus, also referred to as Echinodea. We have the class of Euthrix, and we have got the class Cucumaria. Now, basically, it should have four classes, not five. Now, difference between the classes that we have. If we come across an echinoderm where the body is star-shaped with five short arms, and then it is flat, and the tube feet are on the lower side, then that is in class 
Asterias. Characterized by a star-shaped body with five short arms, tube feet are on the lower side and the body tends to be flat. Class Echinodea or Echinas. For organisms in this particular class, the body is spherical or globular. There are no arms. They have got five rows of tube feet that are found on the sides of the body of the organism. And uh, for them, basically, we talk about the tend, this spherical body tends to be small in size. And then you have the class of your tricks. Ophiotrix is where they have a small body, is greatly reduced. The arms are slender and elongated, which enables them to crawl very, and swim very easily. And the tube feet are greatly reduced. And then last year I've got the class Cucumaria, where the body is elongated and they tend to be worm-like. Example of the organisms in the various classes, we have got the starfish, which is basically in the class Asterias. We have got um, the sea urchin, that is in the class Echinus. We have got uh, the brittle star, that is in the class of Euthrix. And we have the sea cucumber, that is in the class Cucumaria. Then you have the phylum Arthropoda comprising of the animals referred to as arthropods. Arthropoda simply means segmented appendages. So these organisms are characterized by having segments. Characteristics of arthropods. One, they have a chitinous cuticle that covers the body. The cuticle is tough and hard, and the hardness varies from one arthropod to the other. Number two, the cuticle acts as an attachment for the muscles, and because it is on the outside, we say it is an exoskeleton. Thirdly, they undergo molting, meaning they shed off the cuticle from time to time. This is to allow for growth in size to take place. They have a hemocell. Hemocell means a blood-filled body cavity because these organisms don't have blood vessels. So the blood flows freely in the body cavity. They have another system that is found on the ventral side or belly side, and circulatory system is found on the dorsal side, which is opposite of what the higher animals have. They have metameric segmentation. In terms of vision, some groups have got compound eyes, some groups have got simple eyes. And the simple eyes of arthropods are called ocelli. They have a coelom, which is reduced. They are triploblastic. They have bilateral symmetry. Phylum arthropoda has got two subphyla, basically depending on the mouth parts that they have. So I've got subphyla mandibulata, comprising of arthropods, where the mouth parts consist or include the mandible. And then you have subphylum chelicerata, where the mouth parts include the chelicera. Chelicera is a pincer-like appendage associated with the mouth parts. Now to look at the two subphyla, each one has got a number of classes. The classes in subphyla mandibulata, we have got the class crustacea, comprising of the crustaceans, we have got the class Chylopoda, and we have the class Diplopoda, and also the class Insecta. Now, for the crustaceans, they tend to be marine. For them, the body has got two segments. They have a cephalothorax, body comprises of uh, the head fused with the thorax and the abdomen. For them, they tend to have compound eyes, and they are very distinct, and they are born on stalks and they tend to be marine in nature. Example of crustaceans, we have the crabs, the lobsters, and the crayfish. The chylopoda, this one consists of organisms that are basically have got uh, a cylindric, a flat body. The body comprises of many segments that are similar. They have got many pairs of legs, and we have got a pair of legs per body segment, 
and the legs tend to arise from the sides of the body segments. For the chylopoda, they have got antennae, and they tend to be carnivorous in nature. An example of a chylopoda is the centipede. Class diplopoda. Again, for them, the body is cylindrical. They have many body segments that are similar. They have many pairs of legs, and we have got two pairs of legs per body segment. They have a pair of antennae, and they tend to be um, herbivorous in nature. Example of a diplopod is the millipede. For class insecta, it comprises of insects. Insects are characterized by having a body that is divided into three distinct parts, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. They tend to have three pairs of legs that are found on the th attached to the thorax. Uh, they may or may not have wings, but majority have wings. And for those that have wings, they may have one pair or two pairs of wings. For the insects, they tend um, to undergo, they basically do a lot of molting. And uh, for them, because there are quite many, Depending on the presence or absence of, of wings, the insects are divided into two, basically, subclasses. So you talk about the subclass, pterygota, comprising of insects with wings, and subclass, a pterygota, comprising of insects without wings. Now, for the insects with wings, they're the ones that tend to undergo metamorphosis, and the metamorphosis can either be complete or incomplete. For the Aterigota, the insects without wings, for them, they do not undergo metamorphosis. Then we have the subphylum Chelisterata. It has got four classes. You have the class Pycnogonida, comprising of primitive marine Chelicerans. We have the class Meristomata. Again, primitive chelicerans with a broad cephalothorax. We have the class scorpionida, basically comprising of the scorpions. Scorpions are characterized by having a stinging tail, and they also tend to have simple eyes, and the body is flat. And then you have the class arachnida, which are characterized by having simple eyes. They, have a a cephalo they comprise of a cephalothorax. And uh, for them, the cephalothorax and abdomen are distinctly separated by a constriction. So you say they have a waist-like constriction in them. Example of organisms in class arachnida, we have the spiders, we have the ticks, the mites, and so on. Then you have the phylum codata, comprising of the complex organisms simply referred to as codates. Characteristics of codata, we have the abanotocode present at some stage in their life cycle. They have a, hostel, a hollow dorsal nerve cord, the one that basically ends up forming the nervous system, central nervous system. They have pharyngeal clefts. These are basically spaces in the pharynx region that normally provide space for formation of other organs later. They have segmented mass body muscles, so you talk about myotomes. They have a post anal tail. They have a circulatory system that basically flows forwards ventrally and backwards dorsally. They have got limbs that arise from more than one body segment. They have bilateral symmetry and they are triploblastic. Phylum codata has three subphyla based on what happens with the notochord. So I've got subphylum urochordata, subphylum cephalochordata, and the subphylum vertebrata or craniata. Subphylum urochordata, these are codates that have a notochord in the larval stage only. In the adult, there is no notochord. It disappears along the stages of development. So for urochordata, not occurred in the lava only, and it is limited to the tail part only. Subphylum cephalochordata. 
For the cephalocordates, the natural cord is present and it persists throughout the life cycle of the organism and it extends to the head. For subphylum vertebrata or craniata, the notochord cord is actually replaced by the vertebral column or what we simply refer to as the backbone. The vertebral column can either be made up of bone or it can be made up of cartilage. And then for them we also find the brain is enclosed in the cranial cavity. These are the bones that form the cranium. So because they have a vertebral column that replaces the notochord, and they also have a brain enclosed in a cranial cavity, that is why they are referred to either as vertebrata because of the vertebral column or craniata because of the brain present in the cranial cavity. Now we shall look further at vertebrata. So for the subphylum vertebrata, it basically has got five classes, so to speak. Now the five classes comprise of the class pieces that comprises of the fish, the class amphibia comprising of the amphibians, the class reptilia comprising of the reptiles, the class aves comprising of birds, and the class mammalia comprising of the mammals. Now for the case of the class species comprising of the fish, we have got further subclasses in here. So I've got a subclass chondrichthys, basically comprising of cartilaginous fish, and the subclass of stachthys comprising of the bony fish. Now we also do have another subclass comprising of the anathans, which are jawless fish. Now to look at the characteristics of the fish. Generally fish are found in water, so you say they are aquatic. Their body is covered by scales. They have got fins for locomotion. They do have, majority have got lateral lines for sensitivity. They breathe using gills. For them, they have a swim bladder. Some have got lungs for purposes of buoyancy. And they are poikilothermic, meaning they cannot regulate their body temperature internally. They regulate it and it actually changes with environmental conditions. And then we have amphibians. For the characteristics of the amphibians, generally. For the amphibians, we have they are partly aquatic, partly terrestrial. For them, they've got a soft, moist skin that can act as an additional respiratory surface in addition to the lungs. They do not have scales. The skeleton is comprised of bones. They have two pairs of pentadactyl limbs meaning two pairs of limbs that end up in five digits. So penta means five, ductile means digits. For them, they have got external fertilization and they need water for reproduction. They have got visceral clefts in the larval stage only, where the larval stage for the amphibians is called the tadpole. The adults basically tend to be more terrestrial and they use lungs for respiration. They undergo metamorphosis where they change form. The larva is very different from the adult. They don't have external ears and they tend to be poikilotherms just like the fish. For the case of the amphibians, you talk about three classes, rather three orders in this particular class. Yeah. So basically for the amphibians, we talk about three orders. We have got the order Apoda, amphibians without any legs. We have got the order Eurodela, amphibians with basically a long elongated tail. And we've got the order Anura, comprising of amphibians without a tail at all. And then we have the next class of reptiles. Yeah. Now, for the characteristics of reptiles, for reptiles, they are mainly terrestrial, but you'll find a number of them also will find them near our water body because of the fact that they cannot regulate the internal body temperature. Their skin tends to be covered with the dry scales. They have a bony skeleton. They have two pairs of pentadactyl limbs. 
mm, they tend to have internal fertilization, then they lay the fertilized eggs. Some of them will take care of their young, some will not take care of the young. And the fertilized eggs tend to produce young ones that are similar to the adult. They are basically small forms of the adult. For them, they don't have an external ear, and they are also poikilothermic. One other characteristic of the reptiles, they tend to live for a long period of time, but they have got very slow rates of reproduction. <coughs> Here you have the birds, characteristics of birds in class eaves. For the birds, the body is covered by feathers. The legs tend to be covered by scales, the lower part of the legs. They have got two pairs of pentadactyl limbs. And the four limbs are modified into wings for flight. The skeleton is light, made up of pneumatic bones. Pneumatic bones are bones that have got spaces in them that are filled with air. This is an adaptation to make the skeleton to be light in nature to make flight easy. They have a heart that has got four chambers in it, so you talk about a four-chambered heart. They don't have teeth, but they have a honey beak. Fertilization is internal. The female lays the fertilized eggs, which hatch into young ones that are miniature forms of the adult. They have got a very well-developed egg that is covered by a protective shell that is made up of calcium carbonate. They don't have external ear, but unlike the other classes before, the birds can regulate the internal body temperature, so they are homeothermic. <coughs> then we have the mammals. Mammals are the higher, rather the category or class of highest animals that we have. The mammals basically they have the following characteristics. They have got hair on the skin or at least a part of the body. They have a bony skeleton, two pairs of pentadactyl limbs. For them, they breathe or carry out gaseous exchange using lungs. This time they have an external ear that is quite visible. The young ones are nourished by milk that is produced by the, from the mammary glands. Now, for them, they can also regulate their body temperature. There are three subclasses of mammals. We have those mammals that produce milk from the mammary glands that they use to feed their young ones, but they lay eggs. They don't give birth. So those ones, we put them in the subclass monotremata, meaning egg-laying mammals. They refer to as the primitive mammals. And then you've got mammals that give birth to young ones that are not very mature, so they cannot survive well on their own. So these mammals have got a pouch called a masopium, where the young ones complete development before now it can move out to live on its own. So for such mammals, we put them in the subclass masopelia, which refers to as poached mammals, meaning they have got a masopium. And then you have the other subclass of mammals, Mammals that give birth to fairly mature young ones that can exist quite well. So for those ones, they don't have a pouch. Those ones, we put them in the subclass, eutheria. So depending on what the mammal does, we have got three subclasses. Monotry matter, egg-laying mammals, subclass masopelia, the poached mammals, and subclass eutheria, that is the mammals without a pouch and give birth to fairly mature young ones. And that brings us to the end of today's lesson. Thank you and stay safe. These televised lectures supplement our robust online learning going on on our MKU online platform. You can view more on our televised lectures via our online platform. We are in a digital era and Mount Kenya University knows this. The following are the steps to follow so as to complete your online application. Download the application form from the website www.mku.ac.ke. Attach copies of your academic certificates and ID. Pay the application fees via M-Pesa pay bill number 270988. Your ID is the account number. 2,000 shillings is the charge for a postgraduate. You can also deposit in the bank accounts provided on the website. 
Then email all the above to apply at mku.ac.ke.